we have Dennis here. Uh, he just gave a track, uh, a talk at a main track, and this is a continuation of his talk where he's going to do a quick review, and then he's going to get into some of the stuff with the Xiaomi firmware and the ARM Cortex M. I said that in a weird order, so sorry for my Yoda. Um, all right, and with that, are you ready? Yeah. Awesome. Here's Dennis. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, so who of you have been actually in the Flamingo and saw the Evertalk? Oh, okay. So I'm sorry, the first 10 slide might be, might be a little bit, you know, like coming, uh, might be a little, little bit so, uh, similar um, to the main track, but uh, yeah, I mean, I try to get quickly over that. So um, the outline for the talk would be like uh, the following. So I give you a short uh, motivation, uh, give you an introduction to the Xiaomi cloud, and then we go to the devices. And now the important part comes the step-by-step -step binary patching. Um, some information about me. Um, I'm a researcher at Northeastern University in uh, Boston, and I'm working with Professor Guevara Nobir. And I'm also a grad student at the TU Darmstadt in Germany. I'm working there with the Zemo lab. Um, the main stuff what I do at the moment is I do reverse engineering of interesting devices, interesting devices in terms of um, devices which I can use um, in my home, for example, or use on me. Uh, so IoT at the moment is very interesting for me, smart locks, and uh, as a lock picker, of course, also physical locks. Okay, let's start with your motivation. So why do we reverse IoT? And this is like more or less depending on like the so-called attacker model. Uh, some people do that uh, to find and exploit uh, vulnerabilities to hack other people. But the more interesting stuff for me is um, I want to uh, make uh, give you the possibility um, to disconnect your devices from the uh, from the vendor's cloud. Um, there have been like a very famous incident, I think, in May this year, where the company Yealing uh, just disconnect all the European users of the light bulbs. Um, uh, by the way, this, this company um, disconnected all the European users of their light bulbs because they thought like, thought like, yeah, the GDPR is too risky for us because we're collecting a lot of data, so we just kill uh, like throw all the people uh, from Europe out of our cloud, which uh, make all the light bulbs in Europe more or less useless. Um, but like two weeks later, they created like a European cloud, especially for the European users. So now it's uh, okay again. But the thing is, like, it shows us um, that the IoT devices are strongly re uh, relying on the Vendor. Another thing is we want to get more functionality. For example, adding new features or localization. Uh, devices uh, like this smart home gateway speak Chinese. I don't. So it would be better if it would speak English or German or whatever. Another thing is also geo-blocking. Some um, of the devices um, are only working in specific countries. So if you try to uh, connect specific IP cameras like in US, they won't work because they rely on Chinese servers which block US IP addresses. Um, so to avoid that, you need to do reverse engineering there. So how this whole thing started? Uh, in May 2017, I started with Daniel Wigema, and he is sitting in the front, line here, uh, front row here. And with the vacuum cleaning robots and the uh, Xiaomi Mi Band, which is a smartwatch like this, which is also from Xiaomi. And we continue to work on the smart home gateway, uh, the light bulbs, mostly all the stuff that you see in the front of me, but even more so um, over the time, a lot of devices were coming around. Okay, so about the Xiaomi Cloud. Um, Xiaomi cl uh, claims actually to have the biggest IoT ecosystem worldwide, so way bigger than Google or Samsung. They have uh, over 85 million devices and 800 different models. Uh, the most interesting model that I've saw so far is a uh, smart uh, toilet seat, actually, which has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and can recognize the, the person who's sitting on it and uh, setting up the temperature and uh, um, making some lightning stuff. Um, if you buy a product which is working with the Xiaomi Cloud, then it's, um, it could, the chances are very high that it's actually not produced by Xiaomi, but uh, by a third-party vendor. So uh, what the cloud ecosystem is doing, it connects uh, different vendors in one ecosystem, and all the devices are using the same protocol. Um, this cloud system also supports different technologies, and for us as reverse engineers, uh, the most important thing is the implementation is different from manufacturer to manufacturer. So if you see a device which is like super secure and they have all the stuff enabled like secure boot and so on, doesn't mean that it has to be the same case for all the other devices which are in the same ecosystem. 
Um, also, the software quality is very, very different. So you see sometimes very stupid things. Uh, the, the best thing that I saw is like some file um, which was copied from Stack Overflow or something with some example for, for a batch script. So you see everything there. So this is um, some um, uh, overview about the cloud. So what we see here is the main tech the three technologies which we use, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, LE, and Zigbee. Um, and the central component, if you have this kind of devices, well, it's your smartphone, actually. So on your smartphone, you usually have the Mi Home app installed, and the Mi Home app is making sure that the devices uh, get their initial setup. So you enter your Wi-Fi credentials in your, in your smartphone, then your smartphone is talking to the, um, to the IoT devices, and as soon as this, uh, this is done, they create their own uh, connection to the internet. So after that, they connect it directly to the internet, um, without like the smartphone. So you can walk around with your smartphone, but the devices have still a connection. So in the next step, I take a look at the um, cloud protocol um, for the device to cloud communication. Um, to connect to the cloud, you need um, two credentials. And the one credential is the device ID, which is a unique uh, pair device. Um, for the Wi-Fi devices, it's like an eight digit number. Um, for the other devices, it depends. Uh, for, for Zigbee devices, it's some, I think, some MAC address. Uh, for the Bluetooth devices, uh, there's also some number. And there are two kinds of keys. Um, there's a cloud key. This is um, used for the cloud communication, um, so device to cloud communication, and this, this key is also static. For most of these devices, it's burned in into the one-time programmable memory, so you cannot change it yourself. Every time you boot up this device, it's like, um, it's get, it gets loaded from the one-time programmable memory. And um, if you do updates, if you do provisioning and so on, this always stays the same. Um, for the token, it's a little bit different. This is uh, used for the app to device communication. For example, if you want to control the vacuum cleaning robot in your local network, uh, it's a little bit time critical, so you don't want to wait like one second uh, for the command uh, to, to go over the cloud, so you can speak also directly with the device. And for that, we use a, um, also a key which is dynamic. That means every time you connect it to a new Wi-Fi, this key gets regenerated. So it's a different key, like every time you um, create, uh, for example, a new Wi-Fi, or if you provision it um, newly. Um, the payload itself, um, this protocol can speak TCP and UDP, uh, depending on what you block. So if you block uh, TCP, then it just will happily um, talk over UDP. And this is how it looks like. Um, the the, the payload is encrypted, and the encryption key is more or less depending if you're speaking with the app or if you're speaking with the cloud. The important thing here is if you have an unprovisioned device, um, which, which you take just fresh off the, off the packet or you have a, a done a factory reset, then the device tell you the token, which is like the second the secret key, um, in the checksum field. So um, this is required that your uh, smartphone is able to provision the device. Um, as you see here, they do some integrity thing. This is uh, so the, the uh, checksum is also protected with the key and uh, all the other stuff is encrypted with AES. Um, one interesting thing here is we have like this uh, epoch timer. Maybe I see it here. Uh, this, this thing here, which, which is a Unix uh, timestamp, and this is also used for time synchronization because usually if you boot up a device, then it doesn't have time, so over this thing, they can also synchronize the time. The protocol itself is uh, JSON formatted messages, and uh, every packet is more or less identified with a packet ID, and you have two different structures, more or less, methods and parameters, this could be like commands, or results. For example, if, you, if the cloud asks you something, then you, get a, then you send a result to the cloud, or like the, uh, vice versa. The thing here is um, every command and response is confirmed by the receiver, so um, you, you always make sure that the command has actually reached. I have here one example for, for such a command. Um, this is uh, the actual login, more or less, of the device to the cloud. So what happens here is, it, um, if you see here, it, uh, it tells the, uh, the, the cloud which kind of Wi-Fi you have, which is the SSID of your Wi-Fi access point, what's the local Mac, uh, IP address, um, and so on. And the, uh, for example, also the version number. So let's take a look at how these devices do their updates. And there are three different methods how we can do firmware updates. Um, there's one thing where we can do um, app updates, which is the main software, more or less. Um, so the cloud tells the device, hey, here's the firmware update under this URL, and the MD5 checksum that you should expect is like this. Um, the second kind of uh, updates are MCU or Wi-Fi updates. In case of like some devices, it's, for example, the firmware for the Zigbee part. Um, here is also telling, like, here's the URL where you get the firmware update, but 
we have no integrity check. So basically, we don't tell the device um, what kind of um, MD5 has to be expected. So if you change anything there, like for example, you modify the firmware uh, while it gets downloaded to the device, they, they have no way to figure out that something was going wrong. Um, and there's also sub-device updates. Um, for example, if you have this uh, smoke detector, it gets updated over Zigbee over the gateway. Um, then it's more or less the same thing. Uh, instead, we have an additional checksum, which is a CRC32. They, they give you also MD5, but MD5 is actually never, changed, uh, never checked. So this, the protection for this kind of firmware is a CRC32, which is who thinks it's safe? Okay. So one example for a communication um, relation here is uh, between the light bulb and uh, the, uh, the cloud. So this is just to illustrate again, um, the light bulb itself connects directly to the cloud and have their own all st the stuff encrypted, but you can also connect over your smartphone. Uh, and the keys are different, of course, in terms of uh, it depends on the communication. Okay, so um, how we can disconnect these things from the big bad Xiaomi cloud. And uh, for this, um, we developed uh, last year um, a software which is called Dust Cloud, um, which acts more or less as a proxy. And uh, th this is the way how it works. So basically, it's, uh, it is in the middle of the communication between the device and the cloud, um, and can act as a, um, has different modes for it in this case. Um, the exact modes are the following. Um, you can use the Dust Cloud as a proxy. So what happens here is um, it takes uh, the commands which are coming from the device to the cloud and uh, forwards them to the cloud. Or you can just use it as an endpoint so the, the commands are not forwarded to the cloud. Um, the device thinks that it's a, it's a legit uh, Xiaomi cloud, so it's a perfect emulation of that. Uh, you can read the traffic in, in plain text so you know what's going on, which data is sent to the cloud. You may even send your own commands to the device. For example, if you want to do um, like firmware updates, switch on the light, switch off the light. And um, the things what you can do also is like you can uh, change and suppress messages which are coming from the cloud or going to the cloud. Um, one interesting question here is, for example, if you do firmware updates and uh, the cloud wants to push firmware updates onto your device, you can just block it or it can just change the URL or the, the MD5 checksum to, for your firmware. To make the desk cloud work, you need uh, a few things. And uh, for, uh, the first thing what you need is the device ID. Then you need the cloud key, so to be able to decrypt the traffic or to create the traffic. And then you need to do a DNS redirection so that the whole traffic is like coming actually to your desk cloud. Okay, let's take a quick look at the products. Um, so I'm sorry for the people who were in the other talk, it's like the same slide. <laughs> um, if, you, if you use the mainland China server uh, on your smartphone, um, which most of the people do because this, this server supports most of the devices, then your smartphone supports uh, 260 different models of devices. And these devices could be Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Bluetooth LE, or, the same, or like even combinations of that. And uh, so this 260 are more or less depending on, the, on your server location. If you're coming from Taiwan and using the Taiwanese server, then it's uh, like less, it's like I think like less than 100. If you are in US, it's uh, I think like 20, 25. The thing here is the models are not always compatible. So I have a rice cooker which I bought in Taiwan like two weeks ago, um, and I cannot connect it directly to the Chinese cloud. So I have to modify a few things because they make sure that you stay in the regions. Um, like I said, I mean, not all of the products which are actually sold for the Xiaomi cloud are actually from Xiaomi. Um, so this is like, a, um, I mean, this is not very official. So the thing is I just found it out by, by configuration files. So that most of the products are actually by the company Lumi, which are producing all kinds of different sensors like uh, the smoke detector, motion detectors, and so on, and also the gateways. The Xiaomi itself uh, has only 11%, and most of the time they are like the Wi-Fi routers. Um, then we have also Yealink, uh, which is making like all the lightning stuff. Um, one important information here is um, uh, in this um, in this cloud, the smartphones are not connected. So basically, if you have a smartphone from Xiaomi, um, it's not connecting to this cloud. It's like a completely different system. So we're connecting here only the stuff, uh, everything which is like smart home in your like fridge and so on, it's not the smartphones. Um, okay. So now you might ask, okay, about how many devices I can you give you actually any information? And from the 260 models, I have actually 40, 42, and um, my inventory is more or less 99 devices uh, which I bought myself for uh, you know using or reverse engineering. Okay, 
Let's uh, talk about the architectures which are used usually in this kind of IoT devices. Uh, we have the um, Cortex A CPUs, which are more or less the same stuff which you have in your smartphone or a Raspberry Pi, for example. And then you have the Cortex M's, which are embedded devices. And they had like two flavors, uh, the one which have like Wi-Fi. So if you have a device which has only Wi-Fi, then it's very likely that it's a Marvel chip. If you have devices which can do both things, like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth LE, then it's very likely that you have a, um, a MediaTek chip. There's also a thing um, called MIPS, which are mostly used in IP cameras or in some routers, and Extensor, which some of you might know as ESP8266 or ESP32. Um, and the focus of this talk will be more or less this. Um, if you want to know more about the Cortex A uh, CPUs, then you need to go, need to watch the recording of my other talk. There's one good news. I mean, we we have a lot of vendors, but there's one good news, and vendors are always lazy. So. Um, after looking at a lot of um, firmwares, um, what I assume what the development process is looking like, they're just taking the SDK or toolchain from the chip vendor, in this case, for example, Marble. They add some uh, SDK, which is coming from Xiaomi, and they're just looking for an example which fits the best. So for example, okay, we want to switch on the light and or switch off the light, so we need to control GPIO. So in SDK somewhere, there's an example like, okay, how to switch on a GPIO. So we're taking this example, change a little bit the source code, compile it, it runs, publish a firmware. So uh, the good thing about that is all the firmwares are more or less similar. Uh, the memory layout, the functions, the strings, if you know one of them, then it's very likely that you know, uh, that you get a better impression about the others as soon as you see the others. So there's one point uh, which I always love to talk about, why I hate ESP8266. Um, every time I buy a device and I see the following, I open the device and I see it's a ESP controller, I'm always very, very sad. And the reason is the following. Um, ES this extensor architecture is like a very weird architecture. It's like difficult to reverse engineer, not because it's secure, but the thing is you, it's, it's very hard to find a decompiler for that. I don't know if actually any decompiler is existing. Uh, the disassembler support is also very limited. So um, there's a community plugin, I think, for IDA, but um, that's all. And most of the time, you can't really use uh, JTAG um, because the GPIOs are reused for other stuff. And I think the JTAG is, support is actually not, not existing, more or less. The good news is it's very easy to replace the firmware. And there are two reasons. Um, you have, most of the time, you have some connections. In this case, you can connect to the serial, or you have the... Um, pins which you need to ground to make it like more or less low to firmware. Um, so the, the people of you, uh, so the people here who worked with ESP8266 probably know that. And the other thing is spoken, uh, speaking about updates, um, you can push the update over UART or you can just uh, create your own OT OTA update. And the reason here is we don't use SSL and they transmit their unencrypted firmware over HTTP. And they don't check for MD5. So, well. Uh, yeah. But um, the reverse engineering of that stuff is uh, not making a lot of fun. So this is like a desk lamp that they have from E-Link and uh, you have to sort of stuff and uh, yeah, not, very, not so nice. There's one thing. Um, if someone of you knows how to reverse engineer ESP8266 firmware and can show me and it works for me, you can win this very nice light bulb, smart light bulb, which is not an ESP, I promise. Um, so if anyone knows, of, knows that, then come to me and uh, you can get this very nice light bulb. Okay, let's start with our devices. Um, so uh, here we're talking about the smart home gateway, the loud bulbs, and all the LED strips. Um, I put it in one group because they have the same uh, processor, uh, they have the same chip, they have the same layout, so it's quite easy to, to work on them. So um, to remind you, this, these are these devices, for example, so they, they have the Wi-Fi connection directly, and if you take a look at the hardware, we see the following. So we have a Marvel CPU, um, which is a Cortex M4F uh, with 200 megahertz. We have a little bit of RAM, like 512 kilobyte of RAM. Um, and depending on the device which we have, the light bulbs, for example, have four megabyte of SPI flash and the gateway has 16. All of them have a um, Wi-Fi core. And uh, for all of them, the device ID and the key is stored in the one-term programmable memory. So if you, if you dump the flash memory, uh, the SPI flash, for example, you don't get the key because it's in, in the, on the chip. Um, especially for the gateway is um, that it has an NXP a Zigbee chip. So um, this is like a special like um, different controller on in the device which takes care of all the Zigbee stuff. Okay, 
so this is like also an overview uh, about the, the chip itself. So what you see, so an interesting thing here is more or less that the, uh, this Marvel CPU has two ARM cores more or less. So you see one is the Cortex M4F, but it has also this communication processor which, which takes care of all, like for example, Wi-Fi and so on. For the gateway, the question is, okay, what kind of Zigbee devices you can connect to that? And from Xiaomi, or like from the, in the Xiaomi cloud, there are like a lot of devices available. For example, door sensors, temperature sensors, power plugs, motion detector sensors, buttons. One of my favorite is also the, the smoke detector, which is uh, always a thing like, hey, let's put security related, uh, safety related devices into the, uh, into the cloud. What can possibly go wrong? Or like sm some uh, smart door locks. Okay, so yeah, let's get a little bit more technical. So if you um, taking a look at the part uh, partition table of the gateway, for example, you uh, will see that they have uh, the typical thing what nearly all of the IoT providers do. Uh, they have multiple copies of the operation system. So basically here, um, you have the application firmware, this app, FW, is existing twice. The Wi-Fi firmware is also existing twice. And uh, you have a boot sector and some uh, partition which holds all the, um, the config variables. Right. Um, oh, yeah. So the, the, the important information here is also that if you have a firmware update, it's actually the image of one partition. So uh, if you do a firmware update, then it's just overwrites a complete partition. It's, it's not doesn't replace a single file because there's no files available, but it just completely re replaces the partition. So how we can get the keys? Um, it depends a little bit on the device. Um, so for the smart home gateway, which I have actually open here, so if you want to take a look later. Um, it has a lot of test points and it has SWD enabled by default. Uh, if you ever have this kind of device, then here is like the layout of the pins. Um, we have SW, we have uh, our serial port there so we can um, get some information. And the information we can get is actually as soon as the device is running, we can connect over SWD and just dump the whole memory and get the key from there. If you connect over um, um, serial, then you can get access to a CLI. And I mean, this is like a long list of, of, of commands, but the most important are this one. So you can, if you connect it over serial, you can update the firmware directly without any um, need to, to manipulate like man manual models or whatever. So you can just send to your own server there. So while, while it's very easy to um, get access to the gateway, it's a little bit more difficult if you have, for example, um, a light bulb. And then the question is, hey, can we, can we get access to this thing um, without a hardware attack? And a hardware attack, what I mean with that is, um, so the, the light bulb, what you see here in the picture, is actually, at the end of the day, if you want to extract uh, the, the chip from there, is you have to saw it open because it's like, you know, a little bit complex to, to, to open it. So this is usually the case which you don't want to use after that, after you, you get access to this device. So the, we, what we want to do is we want to get some access on the device without sawing the device open. And the, the good news here is again, the firmware are not signed, so what we can just do is, hey, just create a modified firmware which gives us the key automatically. Okay, uh, the bonus of that would be we don't need a hardware access. But there's a big problem, and the problem is um, in a difference, for example, to the vacuum cleaner, which runs a complete Ubuntu operation system, these light bulbs have a bare metal OS. So basically you have no, uh, so you have just one binary which is running, and no like file system where you can change like individual binaries. So we need to do, we need to patch the binary. Okay, so let's talk about binary patching. So uh, if you have a binary, what happens uh, quite often is that we have some, or in our original code, we have some, some function which is running, and at some point you have some, for example, branch links which are jumping in some other um, code. Um, our goal, if you want to modify this thing, is that we have some patch code, and we somehow um, uh, manipulate this branch link that it, instead of going to the original code, it goes into the patch code. Um, to not break the functionality after that, um, we want to go back um, at the end, so we want to call the original function after that again. So what does it mean? So we need to modify uh, the uh, program flow. We need to add existing co uh, additional code. Um, but the trick here is also we need to use uh, existing functions um, because all the things which are not present in the firmware, we need to bring somehow into the firmware. Okay, so why, why is binary patching so difficult? Um, Especially for ARM, it's, it's the case, so as soon as you override branch instructions, the new address is more or less dependent of the program counter. So you cannot, you cannot work with fixed um, 
fixed addresses in, in uh, the branch links. Um, most of the time, if you want to modify binaries, you need to write um, new code in assembly, which some people can do, but I think most of the time it's a little bit risky. Especially if you have a light bulb where you have only one shot to push your firmware on it. If it crashes, then the light bulb is done. Um, also, what you need to do is to model the address space. Uh, so you need to have some idea what, what the RAM will look, look like if you want to access the ROM um, and so on. And you need to make sure that you have specific free space for patches later. And um, you need core existing functions. And this, now the problem is because we have a lot of devices, you need to handle different firmware versions and different devices. So luckily for us, there's a, there's a great, great uh, tool for that, and which is called Nextmon. Um, and this uh, takes uh, care of most of these problems. So what's Nextmon? Um, Nextmon uh, was in, uh, initially uh, developed by Daniel Wegema and Matthias Schulz um, at the Zemo Labs in, at the TU Darmstadt. Daniel is also here in the first row, so if you have any questions to him, he is <laughs> happy to answer that, I, help, I hope so. It's a C-based firmware binary patching framework and it supports uh, Cortex-A and Cortex-M binaries. Um, so you not only can uh, modify Cortex-M firmware, but, but you can also modify Cortex-A um, binaries in your Linux system, for example. And um, the main use case of this uh, framework was to modify the full Mac Wi-Fi firmware in, uh, for example, smartphones or like on a Raspberry Pi. So what you can do with that is you can modify the ARM firmware in your, um, in the, in your smartphone's Wi-Fi chip. So, um, for example, the, 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 re uh, the idea of that is to enable monitor ports so you can, uh, can see um, uh, Wi-Fi traffic, which is not uh, supposed for, for you, or you can do other stuff. Um, for our use case, uh, we want to use it to modify IoT firmware. Um, next one itself is, uh, is quite black magic, so it contains a lot of um, make files, scripts, and a GCC plugin. So this is uh, more or less the, the map, what it does for the Wi-Fi firmware, but uh, for us, um, it's, we don't need so much, so uh, for us, it's the, the simplified version is absolutely okay. Um, the interesting thing here is that um, what, does, uh, next one, uh, what next one does for us is um, it taking our patch and it makes sure that it get linked to the correct functions which are already existing in, in the code. So basically it takes care of all the linking and so on, so we don't uh, need to do it manually. The requirements for that are the following. So we need, at some point, we need to have the firmware or the binary, of course. Um, then we need to know the memory layout, so where the functions are, uh, or how the, the binary is loaded, for example, or how the memory is looking like. Uh, if you want to, uh, to write patch code, then, in, then we need to have a free space on the flash for the patch, patch code. If you don't have enough uh, free space, for example, if the um, flash chip is already full, then you need to make some free space in terms of delete functions which are maybe not used, or hopefully not used. And uh, if you want to reuse functions, you need to know the function names uh, and the signatures, and you need to know where they are. Okay, like I said, this is a step-by-step -step approach. Let's start with step one and retrieving the firmware. Um, so the whole time I was talking about this, the smart home gateway, but it's more or less the same for the light bulbs and for the, all the other um, products which are based on this chip. Okay, so how we get the firmware? Um, there's one possibility. If you open the device, you can just dump the SBI flash for example, JTAG SWD, or the solder the flash. Um, a helpful tool, if, you're, if you want to use JTAG or SWD, you can uh, use um, Raspberry Pi, it's absolutely sufficient for that, and with open OCD. The good thing is Marvel gives you all the, the tools already to, uh, to connect to this uh, chip over uh, SWD or JTAG. If you disorder the chip, you can read it out with flash ROM. The other possibility is that you intercept the traffic via the firmware update. Um, but here the idea is the following, it's, it's, it's very advised that you actually block the updates, that you get the, um, that you intercept the, the firmware update, but you block it for the device. Um, because you don't want the device to, to actually update the firmware. And uh, here Xiaomi gets a little bit sneaky, so if DNS is failing, if they try the first time to update the, uh, the firmware over the, with a DNS address, uh, and it fails, then they send the command again, this, this time with an IP address. So if you're clever enough to redirect the host names in your router, then in a second time this device will be updated. Um, for some devices, uh, not for this lightning stuff, but for, for other devices, if they use SSL, most of the time um, you can just use fake certificates, or um, what I experience if you block SSL, at some point they, go, they, they fall back to HTTP and they do the update over HTTP. Um, the goal of this whole thing is to retrieve the special URL for the firmware update, and the reason is the following. Um, 
If you want to download the firmware, the fir file names are not easy guessable because uh, the file name of the firmware update um, has the MD5 checksum of the firmware update. As you usually don't know it, you can download it. The other thing is where CDN is using aut authentication. So basically, um, you get uh, some kind of token to download the firmware, uh, which is, uh, I think, valid like for two months or so. But, but still, you need to have this token uh, to be able to download the firmware. If I just give you the URL with the file name, you can download it, you get the access denied. So you need this, this URL. Let's, let's assume that you have it already. So you intercepted it, for example, with Wireshark, or you have the, fir the firmware image. The next step, what we need to do is we need to parse the firmware. Um, firmware has the bad uh, altitude that they have a proprietary format, and it's like difficult to load it in IDA Pro, for example. And uh, you need to know where the segments are, what the segments are, how big they are, and where the ent entry point is. So our goal here is to convert the firmware to some kind of ELF format or ELF file, because the ELF file has some description and, and it tells you where the segments, for example, are. So we need to understand how it works. And the idea here is like the, t the typical thing what you do all the time. So you get some kind of SDK from the vendor. For example, for Marvel, you can download their Amazon uh, SDK. And you just compile a sample firmware and you just look, okay, so I have to, at some point you have the L file and then you look, okay, what's the output and then you try to figure out what's going on there. And um, for Marvel is the case that it creates at some point the L file and they're using then later in the script a tool which is called uh, a a a EFX to a firmware which converts the firmware to a binary format. So we did back then the res uh, engineering for you so this is how the, uh, the header looks like from the, from the format format. And uh, we have a tool which can go from this binary format into uh, the ELF format and from ELF back to, to binary. Um, there's one fun thing um, which I never tested, but if someone of you has the uh, smart Barbie doll, it has the same chip, actually. So this is um, for, you, for, for the people of you who don't know that. It's not from Xiaomi, it's from, from the Barbie company. Uh, whatever Bobby is doing, uh, which company is doing Bobby. Um, it's actually a doll where your ki the kids can tell the, your Bobby some stories and then as parents you can listen to the stories um, on your smartphone. So if, if, if your kid is telling your Bobby a secret, then you as a parent will know that. A little bit scary, but yeah. In case of MediaTek, the format is looking quite similar. Um, again, um, we have some kind of segments. Uh, this time we use some kind of checksum while the uh, Marvel firmware has no checksum in, in there. Um, basically, if you change specific, like if you change the U URL in the binary, then you can upload the binary and it should be fine. So let's take a look at the workflow for Marvel. So let's assume we have intercepted the firmware, or we download the firmware ourselves, how we get, how we get uh, the, uh, um, the um, how we pass the firmware. So as soon as we run our parser tool, what it does is it figures out where the sections are and creates our, for us uh, um, the sections as, as uh, individual files and two kinds of scripts. And the one script is the description of the sections uh, for the LD command, which is later important for uh, manufacturing uh, to rebuild the firmware. And the second uh, script which you get out of uh, our tool is that it gets commands for the object copy and also the LD command. So if you if you run um, the builder command, then at the end of the day, you have an L file which is correctly, uh, which is um, built up correctly. As an example here, um, I, this is the command which I run for the firmware um, um, which I downloaded like a few days ago. And I actually, yeah, it's a quite new firmware. You see the build date. This is the date uh, where they built actually the firmware. Um, and you see it has three sections. And when we run, um, uh, this is how the, the, uh, the thing to run, uh, looks like. And as soon as I uh, run this builder script, what you see there, uh, at the end of the day, we get an L file, which is also um, correctly working. In theory, you could take this L file and can run it on a, on a Linux, but I think it shouldn't do anything, at least, yeah. So having the L file now, what can we do next? Uh, well, we can load it in a dis dis disassembler. So I use IDA because I got at some point an IDA li license. Um, I think most of, most, of the, uh, most of you will use um, a different disassembler. But you, you can just load the, uh, the, the file into IDA and you can figure out where the interesting uh, areas are. What I figured out at some point is that you have some uh, spaces in the uh, firmware where at some point uh, the data from the one-term programmer memory is, is copied into this space. So basically what you see here is the, uh, these are the three main interesting fields. Uh, tag, Mac is the place where the MAC address is like stored later. 
uh, tag the, the ID is the address where the um, um, device ID is stored and the key. Um, below there, there's also the model number, so theoretically you could um, get the model number, but the model number is known. And uh, there's also an area for the local, uh, for the uh, for the server. For example, if, if you have a Taiwanese uh, device, then it's like TW there, or if you have Chinese device, it's empty. Right. So now we need to prepare um, all the data for next month. So. Um, I showed you the, the partition layout in the beginning. So um, what, I, what we figured out is that the partition has a size of 614 kilobytes, and the size of the original firmware is only 569. So basically, we have a lot of space for our patches. Um, so the trick is, as we need uh, space for our patches, we just append uh, 1,280 null bytes, which is that bad in hex. So we end. Uh, with a new section file, um, I, I cho we have chosen section file two because it contains all the code, um, where we have the original section and uh, we have the patch code. So this is looking like this. So now we have some some space um, to um, to put our patches in. If you do it in Linux, it's quite easy. You can ju just use uh, DD to do that. So at the end of the day, we have some space for our patches. Now the next step is we need to figure out what are, what are the function names, and um, for example, for every function that you want you to use later in the source code uh, in your in your own patch, you need to figure out if it's existing already in in, in the firmware or not, or you have to introduce it later. So how we do that? Um, again, we take the SDK, we compile an example project which more or less contains all the stuff which we need later. Um, and because it's compiled with debug symbols, what we can do is that we can load the binary into IDA. It make a uh, make a diff uh, um, between uh, the our unknown like uh, executable and our example executable. Um, for either there's a free plugin which is called Bindiff which you can download. Um, for me only the version 4.2 works, so 4.3 is somehow completely bugged and doesn't work for me. Um, so what it, what it, how does it look like? So you see here on the left side the name primary. These are all the unknown functions which are in uh, the binary. And on the right side, uh, the name secondary, these are actually the functions which I use for my example project, which I compiled myself. So basically, I can align all the functions, um, all the unknown functions, um, into my, um, into my unknown firmware. And then no more, like, I think 70% of the functions are unknown after that. So for our example for this gateway, uh, I have chosen a few functions which are um, interesting for me. For example, there's a HTTP C get command, which is doing a get query to, to a web server. I found out where, what the address is for that. There's a bin to hex um, command. SNPrintf is also quite useful. VMPrintf is a console output, so if you connect it over serial, uh, then this uh, command is used to, uh, to output anything on, over serial. And uh, for the Xiaomi Cloud specific, there's a command called, uh, or a function called OTU timer info. And this is actually the um, login command uh, to the cloud if the device is um, connected over UDP. So like I said, this device can com communicate uh, to the cloud over TCP and UDP. So if you patch the UDP function and something goes wrong, we have still the TCP function, so we can maybe unbreak the device if we did something completely horrible wrong. Um, what we use here in this uh, OTU timer info function, there's at some point an SN printf, and this is like the address of the SN printf. This is also useful for, for later. Okay. So, after that, we have the binary. We have, uh, we know how the memory la layout looks like, because the, the header file of the firmware told us more or less where the segments are loaded, at which memory addresses. We created uh, more free space um, to, to, uh, for the flash of the patch. In the flash of the for, for the patch, and we know now the functions, uh, uh, function names, and the signatures. So we need to configure next month. Um, so next month, like I said, is consisting of, um, of a lot of like different scripts. And now I give you like a step-by-step -step thing what you need to do if you want to add a new device. The first thing is uh, there's a, a firmware version file where you just need to create uh, um, like a, uh, define like a number for the device. It could be any number, just some some number which is internally used by by the GCC plugin uh, of next month. Um, so just define like a new device and maybe a new firmware. And the next step, um, we need uh, to tell a next month if you create a device where it can find any, everything. So for example, um, where is our original code? 
Uh, this information we know from from a deposit tool, and also we need to tell it where is the space for the patch uh, for the patch code. And for both things, we need to tell it uh, how much space is is available. Um, especially the, the patch size is very important, so you don't want to go over uh, over this. Uh, um, I actually don't know what happens if you have if the patch is bigger than this, but usually it should never happen. Right. So the next thing is. Now we want to write up, uh, we want to define the existing functions. So like I said, for me the, the uh, interesting function was uh, HTTP C get. Uh, so here you see the, the device, um, uh, sorry, the function uh, name and the signature. So these are the uh, um, um, arguments that it has. And what you do here is, and this is the important thing, is you tell more or less the next month framework at which address it can find uh, the, um, this, this function in the, in the uh, firmware. And the same stuff we do for the bin, bin to x function, we do it for uh, s, oops, sorry, for s n print f, and we do it also for v, uh, for this vm print f, which is giving us uh, the console output. So by this, we're telling uh, next one exactly where you can uh, where it can find the stuff for this one particular device and uh, for this one particular firmware version. Okay, so let's write our patch, compile, and rebuild. So this is one of one one of my example patches. So um, what I do here is actually I do HTTP requests to my server. Um, so we saw in IDA where the interesting memory areas are. So here are the addresses of the MAC address, device ID key. I created a, a buffer, and what I do here is I convert the key into in some hex format, and I run just uh, HTTP GET on my server. So uh, later on, if I look at my server log, I can see the uh, key hopefully in clear text. Um, the important he thing here is that um, we need to tell uh, the Nextman framework where it has to, um, to, to to patch this thing. So in this case, this address is more or less uh, the uh, original uh, br branch instruction, uh, the, the branch link. And uh, the thing, because we don't want to break the functionality of the device, so here you see also we return actually in the original printf again. So basically we, uh, as, uh, Every time if the SN printf is called in this uh, OTU info function, we jump into this patch, it, we extract the key, and then we jump, uh, we, we go back to the original program flow, so the device is still functional of that. So, now we have our patch, so what, if we do the rebuild thing, so we, um, if we compile everything with, uh, with next one, we get the se uh, segments, uh, sections again, sorry. And then we uh, build uh, the firmware again, and we can use the Marvel tool to build the original firmware, which is then patched. Okay, so now we need to ap apply that. And at this point, I mean, I should say it like before, but obviously your warranty is void after that. Um, every time you open the device, actually, it's a problematic thing. So, how we do that? Um, the first step. And this is the step which we can't avoid, at least for the devices um, like the light bulbs. Uh, we need to have a new firmware update. It must be available. So if, if you're already sitting on the newest firmware update, it's, it's not possible. So the, um, um, as soon as we get like this OTA update command from the, from the cloud, um, then it's a good sign because that means actually there's a new firmware update, so we can somehow manipulate that. And how, how this is done is actually, Oh, sorry, this animation is broken. Um, this is, this would be the usual way. So um, we would uh, get uh, we, we would make a HTTP request to, to the cloud server, and we would get a firmware. But we don't want that because we don't want to have the uh, the newest version on, on the device. Instead, what we're doing here is we we using a DNS, uh, some kind of DNS switch, and we're switching this thing to our IoT village CDN. So our patched firmware is downloaded to the device, and then the device is very happy about that. I tried to prepare a demo, but the thing is, it's nearly impossible to have a Wi-Fi here, so um, I didn't, didn't want to break the devices. But if you're interested, you can take a look um, later on the devices, and we can try something something out. There's one, uh, also one interesting thing. If you get the SDK, we have also some very interesting uh, demo applications there. For example, a P2P demo where uh, the devices uh, can make some peer-to-peer -peer net network in over Wi-Fi. There's a um, Wi-Fi uh, frame inject demo or like a Wi-Fi snip sniffer demo. So you can use this kind of demos for you know your patches if you're interested in doing specific things. Okay, so for the summary, um, what we can do, we can modify the firmware, we can root, we can root the device, and we can do it remotely, and this is thanks to the missing integrity checks. So we don't check for the MD5, we don't have any signatures in the firmware. 
What we can do then is like we can read all the cloud communication in plain text because as soon as we have the key, we can decrypt it and we can run it, for example, also with our own cloud. There's one thing where I told tell anyone or oh, everyone at the end of my slides, and this is like the thing: never leave your devices unprovisioned. I know people who who, bought, who buy the light bulbs and they put just the light bulbs uh, in somewhere in their home and just use them as normal light bulbs, which doesn't make sense for a Wi-Fi connected light bulb. But what happens is this device is un unprovisioned, so everyone who is like in proximity of this light bulb can provision that for you and install some malicious software on, on it. Also, be careful with uh, devices um, which you buy at Amazon or eBay and so on. You have no idea what kind of firmware is installed. And the thing is, you can't, you can't actually check that. So they have no possibility, like with a laptop, to figure out is, this, is the firmware like malicious or not malicious and so on. You can do anything with, uh, with the firmware there. So for the conclusion, uh, the best practices are for IoT devices or like in general for embedded devices are not used. So we have no MD5 verification. Um, if they use HTTPS when it's broken uh, or they don't use HTTPS at all. The certificate verification is also broken. Uh, the hardware security features are missing. So some of the chips actually have features like secure boot or what you can um, do some, uh, some verification of the firmware in hardware. They're not using that. The good thing for us is we can modify devices, but the bad thing is everyone else who have some knowledge about that can, that, can do that too. All right. So I want to thank a few people. Um, Daniel Wigemer, who did uh, the Nextman framework and helped me uh, with uh, all the research. Also Professor Nabir from the, uh, from the Northeastern University. Um, the Zemo Lab uh, with Professor Matthias Hollick from the TU Darmstadt. And Andrew Sellers and his team from the Boston University Cyber Law Clinic. And there's a particular reason why he's there. Um, because in US to publish specific things is a little bit tricky with the law. So basically they make sure that I'm not getting into trouble. So I'm special thanks for them. And that's all for my presentations, and I'm happy to answer your questions, or if you need any contact data, you just can, uh, I created, especially for the DEF CON, a Twitter account, so you can send me Twitters, Twitter messages, tweets, whatever. Uh, or meet me in Boston, or write me over Telegram. Okay, thank you very much.